a man popped his head up with a gun on from a trench and I carried a machine pistol. I fired at him and, and killed him. I was born in San Francisco, California and raised in San Rafael in Marin County just across the bay. Uh, my father was in World War I as a pilot. Uh, he trained and got to Europe just as the war ended, uh, but he flew in World War I. I was going to try and be a pilot like my father, but uh, I have a drippy left eye and couldn't pass the physical for that. And I had uh, skied in uh, New Hampshire with Bob Bates, and uh, he was, gave me a letter of recommendation. You had to have three letters of recommendation to join the 10th Mountain Division. Um, so that uh, I was drafted into the Army at Fort Ord uh, and uh, had a couple of weeks basic training before going to Camp Hale, Colorado to be with the 10th Mountain Division. You learned, one thing you learned to do was, and what, there were two, two things really. <clears throat> you learned to get rid of anything that was absolutely not necessary. Uh, our tents that we had were not uh, suitable for the kind of uh, maneuvering we were doing. Uh, there were two-man tents. So you'd get in, uh, your breath would freeze and make little icicles on the inside. When you bumped it, they'd fall down your neck. So that we learned to sleep out without the tents. We had skis. My skis were seven feet long, uh, depended upon your height. We had seven and seven and a half inch long skis. Um, we had skins, but they were strap-ons rather than stick-ons like you have today. If you went side hill, uh, they slipped around the ski and were useless, so that we learned to freeze them on when we left for a maneuver and leave them on both for going uphill and downhill. And they were really very good because they slowed you down going downhill where we skied in all kinds of conditions, breakable crust, deep powder, uh, wet, sloppy spring snow, um, and carrying 90-pound packs and skiing on, through trees. Uh, you, the key thing was that the skiing was for maneuvering or moving in the mountains during the winter time, not the pleasure skiing that you have today. Um, one thing you had to do is try and stay cold, because if you perspired, uh, uh, and then stopped you very easily, could freeze. We had about 6,000 people that were, went through Camp Hale that either couldn't take the altitude or had serious frostbite or freezing problems. Uh, when we started to climb, I would take off the gloves and the hat, and then un we didn't have zippers, uh, unbutton a shirt and unbutton your fly, and let the breezes blow through and keep you cool. When you stopped, you'd reverse that. When your socks got damp in your boots, I had two pair. I'd wear a pair of socks and inner liners between my wool shirt and wool sweater, uh, so they dry out. And uh, when your socks and inner liners got damp in your boots, um, you'd change, take them and put them between your shirt, put your uh, socks that uh, you had in between your sweater and your wool shirt on your feet. At night, when it came to sleeping, uh, stomp a hole in the snow with the skis, turn the skis upside down. We had uh, double down bags, uh, sleeping bags. Uh, I'd uh, take the boots off and put them between the inner bag and the outer bag and clam in the inner bag and sleep. You'd often woke up in the morning, you were covered with snow. Uh, you'd break out from the snow and uh, the hardest thing was getting your boots on without freezing your fingers. I think that covers the way we dressed and the way we tried to manage ourselves in the extremely cold weather. The 86th Mountain Infantry Regiment left in, at the end of December for Europe. Uh, and we, the 85th, along with the 87th, sailed for Europe. 
on the USS uh, America uh, in January of 1945. Uh, when we arrived in Naples, we uh, disembarked onto ships that had been sunk and turned upside down, and uh, the conditions in Naples were uh, unbelievably bad with the bombing and uh, young kids selling their sisters as prostitutes. It was a uh, terrible, terrible situation. We, I think we were only there for a few days before we went on the landing ship tank uh, up to Laverno and then we uh, moved out uh, and were um, at the Tower of Pisa. Uh, camped there for a few days had the chance to climb to the top and back down. And then we were moved up into a little community called Bandiluca, up on the front line uh, with the Germans on the high ground in front of us. Did patrolling, uh, uh, some of it on skis. That's the only time we used, I used skis in Europe. Uh, we were issued skis. All of our mountaineering gear was taken away from us when we went to Camp Swift. But when we got to Italy, if we were going on patrols in the winter, we were issued the equipment to, to make those patrols. However, when the patrol I went on, we only went about 30 yards in skis. The snow, snow was hard and icy, and the skis are not a very practical thing to try and fight on. So we stacked them and, and climbed up, uh, got up on one of Al Patrepatenza's peaks, and uh, looked down. There's, German guards were on the ridge down below. We waved at them and they waved at us <laughs> and came back down. That was the only contact I had with patrols. Uh, we did some patrolling. We, we went over to the, uh, uh, we called it Querciola. It was, uh, it's a, a little Italian town uh, below the P uh, Riva Ridge and Mount Belvedere and uh, Mount Gorgolesco in February, um, traveling at night with uh, blacked out trucks and then climbed up to this little town and were billeted in Italian houses. Uh, didn't go out at daylight, didn't want the Germans to know we were there. Had big searchlights on the higher peaks on our side of the a combat line that shined into the Germans' eyes at night to keep them from seeing what was going on. The night of February 18, the 86th, went up on Riva Ridge and captured that, completely surprising the Germans. They didn't think it could be climbed. And uh, the uh, 85th and the 87th went up Mount Belvedere uh, and Mount Gorgolesco uh, on the night of the 19th. The night of the 18th, we went out and, built, and dug foxholes below the line of departure. Uh, and th that night at 11 o'clock, we made, started the attack. These were night attacks. And uh, by the morning of the, uh, uh, the 20th, uh, we had uh, captured Mount Belvedere. And I was on, uh, actually, uh, Gorgolesco, our sergeant. Fisher was killed and died in my arms, and that's when I got really uh, emotional, angry, and, and made the attack on Gorgolesco, uh, for which I received the Silver Star. When Sergeant Fisher died, uh, uh, we had machine guns firing at the top of the ridge. I, I moved up to where they uh, were and asked them to point out where the enemy was because you couldn't see the, that well camouflaged. Uh, they pointed it out and I make, came back down to my platoon and uh, I saw a man crawling, an American soldier crawling. So I sensed that the Germans weren't watching. So I ran and crawled and moved up to, to this man. And uh, I said, where are the Germans? He didn't speak, he just said, and then I realized I was right in front of a, a bunker uh, that uh, was firing machine guns. That had been, I had a hand grenade and I managed to toss it into the, the bunker and, and jumped in after it. 
It killed at least two of the Germans in there and the other two uh, that were there surrendered. And uh, I said, Rausmitzig, Rausmitzig. They put their hands up and walked back. And then I moved up over the top of Mark Gogolesko, as I said, and as I started down the inside, a man popped his head up with a gun on from a trench, and I carried a machine pistol, looked like a grease gun. Uh, and I fired at him and, and killed him, and ran down and jumped into that trench, and uh, the two other Germans there surrendered too. Told them to head back, Rausmedik, uh, and they did. And then some of the prisoners that uh, had been moved back started to run down the hill in the little valley just in front of me, and I turned their German machine gun on them, and they stopped. Uh, and uh, then, as I say, the other units started to move through, and uh, the whole hill front in front of me were covered with. Uh, bunkers and, and trenches, the Germans came up with their hands up and surrendered. I moved back uh, then to our unit, that uh, the other units had moved through us. We went down the hill where we, the line of departure where we'd left our packs when we began the attack, and uh, uh, the medics had rifled our, all our packs and taken our blankets for the wounded and dead. And I was furious because that left my men uh, without blankets and it was winter and it was cold. And I made a, a real complaint. Uh, they did get blankets to us in two days, but uh, I was furious that uh, you need to look after the living. The, the dead are dead, and you can't do much about that. The uh, division for the next five days fought along a ridge that uh, controlled Highway 64 to Bologna, that which was a very key uh, military uh, uh, position to capture so that we could control that highway. And uh, we dug in up there. Uh, and uh, they waited for the, uh, the well, no, the, we moved on to the, the ridge, and then we went on the second battle is uh, Mount de la Spey, the Mountain of Hope, and uh, it captured that. And uh, we were ahead of the other units in the uh, Fifth Army in Italy, and we uh, were asked to hold ground and not proceed further until the units could bring up and secure the lines. The last attack I was in was the attack on the ninth, on the uh, 14th of April. Uh, President Roosevelt died on the 12th. We were going to attack on the 12th, but the conditions were overcast and they couldn't give us air, air support, so it was delayed two days. Uh, that day, the 14th, uh, at uh, 7 a.m., the Air Force came in and bombed the holy hell out of the German positions across the valley from us. Uh, when the aircraft pulled out, then the artillery opened up, and I never forget that we heard the booms of the big guns back behind us, and then we could hear the shells whistling overhead, and they more or less struck the objective at the same time. It seemed like the whole mountain exploded. And, and I was sure that uh, we would have an easy time in a day attack, that the Germans must have been uh, totally destroyed by the bombing, but not so. They were very well dug in, and we had the most casualties that day. And that day, I was a casualty from uh, uh, an observer that uh, put an artillery shell in right next to me that fortunately hit a tree. and. Uh, it blew my eardrums out and pricked my head. Uh, but if it had hit the ground, I wouldn't be talking to you today. And uh, within three days, I, I couldn't stand up because of uh, loss of balance because of my ear problem. So I ended up in the hospital in, uh, in Leghorn. And uh, 
then I came down with a, a hepatitis and ended up in the hospital in Naples. <laughs> and then I, uh, when I recovered from that, the, the war ended. Uh, we were only in com combat 110 days. Uh, uh, I was in a hundred of those in the last ten days. The uh, they, this division moved out very strongly and crossed uh, to the Po Valley and they up to the Po River and across the Po River and up Lake Garda up to the end of Lake Garda and, and captured Garda and uh, was on May second and uh, the war ended in Italy on May second with the. German general asking to surrender to our general, General Hayes, because of the uh, respect he had for the 10th Mountain Division's uh, attacks during uh, our combat period. When I got out of the hospital and uh, got back with the unit uh, in June, I was only there a week and came down with polio. <laughs> but very fortunately fully recovered. And I, my legs were paralyzed for about a week or so, and uh, somehow uh, I recovered and I'm perfectly healthy and skiing today. So I've never, never carried a gun since World War II. Um, I would say that was an influence. Uh, I've tried to do the best I can. Uh, I've had a wonderful career. I have a wonderful wife. We have four marvelous children, and 11 grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. Um, I think you have a greater appreciation for all of those wonderful things because of the experience that was just the opposite.